Hi Patricia, first of all, thank you very much for being here with us. Uh, before speaking about the topics, the topics you focus your attention on, I would like to ask you a more general question, a methodological uh, question concerning the status of the contemporary philosophy. According to your point of view, uh, if one wants to uh, understand mind as absolutely to understand brain, and you always add also a sort of uh, uh, epistemological duty for philosophers and you suggest to translate uh, uh, folk psychological concept in uh, uh, neurobiological ones. According to this perspective, I would like to ask you uh, how could it be possible to speak about philosophy, to debate on philosophy and moreover to teach philosophy without any sort of scientific background? Well, that's a very wonderful question and I think that what is really at the heart of your question is the recognition that many of the traditional questions that philosophers have asked about the nature of how we make decisions or what it is to be conscious and, and aware of things about the nature of morality, that these are questions which for a long time uh, could be discussed in isolation from the sciences. But over the last, let's say, 50 years, that has really begun to change. And we're beginning to realize that there are discoveries about the brain that bear on those questions in a way that allows us to understand quite differently the nature of functions such as decision making and learning and memory and so forth. And so I think it is now getting difficult to ask questions in philosophy and to teach classes in philosophy without having some scientific background or at least some background in the psychological and neurobiological sciences. Because students want to know, for example, what's the difference in the brain between someone who is a psychopath and someone who is not? And by psychopath, of course, I mean someone who uh, does not feel remorse when they do dreadful things, someone who really doesn't, in a certain sense, have feelings of guilt, they don't have a conscience. And so students will want to say, well, what's the difference in the brain? Is this, is this a function of a difference in the brain between uh, healthy people and psychopaths? Or they may want to know what happens when someone is addicted to a drug, like, say, cocaine. And it isn't good enough anymore for a philosopher to have a kind of armchair understanding of addiction because we do know quite a bit about the actual changes in the brain that lead to addictive behavior. So your question is actually a very deep question about the, the really significant changes in philosophy that have come about as a result of developments, not just in neuroscience, but also in psychology and in evolutionary biology. Yeah, according to you, what do you think uh, philosophy can actually add to uh, scientific findings? That's also a very good question. Why aren't we just neuroscientists? Now, different philosophers will have a different take on this, but the way I think about it is like this, that any given neuroscientist is generally involved in experiments on one particular small domain of questions. For example, they might be particularly interested in the nature of decision making. And so they will go very deep in a vertical direction to know about that particular subdomain. Now, what a philosopher can do, because we don't generally devote much time to experiments, is that we can go horizontally across many subfields 
of psychology and neuroscience. And so here is an analogy which sort of works and sort of doesn't. But there are, I think, now philosophers who stand to neuroscience and psychology the way that theoretical physicists stand to experimental physics. That is, they synthesize, they theorize, they pull together from very broad range of, of disciplines. So one function, I think, is a kind of synthetic function to go very broadly and take advantage of the vertical depth in all of these other subfields. And uh, how neuroscience are changing uh, our way of conceiving a human being as a social animal, even from the moral point of view? Well, I think that that's just begun, and I, there are, are some ideas about how that works. And I'm just finishing up, actually, a new book called Brain Trust, which addresses this idea, and it will be the focus, because it's my very newest research, it will be the focus of my talk in Bergamo. And basically the idea there is that discoveries about attachment and bonding in all mammals that are very different and result in the different structure of the mammalian brain are kind of the platform for caring about others. And so I think we are learning that being a social animal and taking pleasure from others' company, feeling pain at being shunned or when there is a loss, that these are just part of the way that we are made. And that although culture adds enormously to this basic biological platform, uh, pretty much across the board, I think we have this aspect of caring, especially for offspring, kin, and then the circle gets wider to friends and family that's perhaps quite distant. So I think there is a, is a really important biological story about the basis and the roots of morality. Now, it's not going to tell us the answers to difficult moral questions about such as, you know, who should pay for, for, for cleaning up the oil in the Gulf, for example. It isn't going to tell us answers to those kinds of questions. We have to answer those in the same old way we always have, by getting together and negotiating and drawing on information and trying to solve the problem. Um, but I think that it gives us a much broader perspective to understand the nature of moral, moral motivation and where it comes from and why it can be so powerful. How do you think technology uh, would change our way of living and thinking moral? I see. Yes, yes. Okay, that is a very, very good question. And of course, technology probably from very, very ancient times has had an effect on the moral values that people have. And, and one very obvious way in which that's true is that Technologies that allow people to travel, for example, even just by boat or by train, and then to get an understanding of how other people do things, and that one's own intuitions about what's right and acceptable and what's wrong and unacceptable are sometimes at certain places rather different from how other people do things. And I think that kind of broadening has always been tremendously important. I think it's allowed for certain kinds of tolerance that we probably wouldn't have otherwise. I mean, it's a very old-fashioned thing to say, you know, that travel broadens the mind, but of course it does. And then a certain way I think the Internet has done that too. On the other hand, I, part of what you're asking, I think, is whether a relationship that is largely electronic can be anything like as close or as meaningful as a relationship that is face-to-face. -face. And there I think I'm inclined to suppose that it can't, and that the really deep connections that we have, the deep attachments that we have, really do involve being 
in the physical presence of, of other people. Now, I could be very wrong about that. Um, and how our relationship to one another will change as a result of, for example, being able to connect as we are electronically, um, it, it, it's very hard to know. It's hard to predict. Now, I know that there are parents who worry that their children's friends are almost entirely friends that they talk to and connect with electronically. And my guess is that that is a worry, that the closeness of doing things together, of going fishing together or going hiking together and solving problems in the physical world together, I suspect that's terribly important. Last question, and maybe is the most difficult one. Uh, you remember, of course, the Thomas Nagel's claim when he asked, he wonders, uh, what is like to be a bat? I would like to ask you, according to your philosophical point of view, uh, not what is like to be a bat, but what is like to be as a moral subject. Well, I think. I mean, that's a very beautiful question, and here roughly is the answer, I think. To be a moral subject is to come in, first of all, to come into the world with a certain kind of circuitry so that you become very attached and very bonded to your parents, especially in the very early stages to your mother. Now, just as an aside, we know from studies on rodents, for example, that the animals, the, the, the baby rats that are licked and cuddled and fed by the mother have quite different social behavior as adults than those who get all the same food that don't get the licking and the cuddling and, uh, and the warmth of being next to the mother. And we think that it's likely to be the case that the brain circuitry mediating attachment and bonding, which mediates caring for others, is very, very important in all moral behavior. And that those early experiences, but also the experiences later in life where there are strong attachments and strong relationships, that, that these things are very important. So what it's like to be a moral creature I think is to have very strong feelings for others, to have compassion for their plights when they are in trouble, um, to care about their welfare, to want to be part of the group in such a way that the group as a whole flourishes. And I think the feeling of membership in a group, whether it's within a town or a family or a nation, I think that's a very powerful motivating force. And so these feelings, I mean, they're, they're in, a, in a way very ancient in as much as I think the origin of these feelings is with the origin of mammals. And that's something like 300 million years ago. Now, of course, in humans, these feelings are placed within a context of a very, very sophisticated brain. So it's not like we're just rats. But these feelings are very deep and very powerful, and they were clearly part of the evolution of uh, hominins, Homo erectus, Homo heidelbergensis, and then, of course, uh, Homo sapiens. So thank you very much, Patricia. I hope to see you soon uh, in Italy and goodbye.